AT&T. It's all within your reach. The pretenders were a ball of contradictions. They were punk and pop, English and American, male and female, tough and tender. Christy Hine moved from the Kent State shootings to a job at Malcolm McLaren's sex shop, just as punk rock was born. She watched her friends form the Clash and the Sex Pistols, while no one had time to listen to her songs. But when the world finally did listen, Chrissy Hines' songs changed everything. Through tumultuous marriages, the deaths of her bandmates, breakups and reconciliations, arrests and controversy, Chrissy's songs kept coming, and the world kept listening. The Pretenders are legends. This is their story. It's not about sex and drugs at all. It's about the truth and not bullshit. That's the whole idea of a rock band. It's not to become establishment, it's to never join the establishment. It's about inventing something that anyone can do that has nothing to do with background or culture or anything. Christine Hine was born into a conservative Midwestern family in September of 1951. She was raised on proper table manners and practical values in Akron, Ohio. Her father worked at the phone company, her mother as a secretary. Growing up in the 60s, Chrissy's ear was glued to her transistor radio. Turn me off! In 1965, she saw a performance that changed her life. Mitch Detroit in the Detroit Reels, and they had this this bust up fist fight on stage in the afternoon, and I just was scared and thought I'd never seen anything like that. That really was one of the turning points of my life, seeing this guy fight. And I think uh, you know my my love for show business really probably started there. Chrissy got her first kiss at a rock and roll show on stage. I saw Jackie Wilson when I was about 14. At the end of the show, uh, someone pulled me out of the audience and took me up to the stage, and I'd never been kissed, so I was like, you know, particularly, you know, I certainly had stage fright. I, I had a bad feeling they were going to take me, because there weren't any other white girls in the audience when Jackie Wilson kissed me. I felt very blessed later when I sort of got over it. From that night on, Chrissy Hahn was a goner. Oh, we used to go and see everyone. We'd drive to Cleveland and then come back. And I saw the Velvet Underground. I saw the Yardbirds. I can't remember who played guitar with them or anything. And of course, I mean, it must have been around that time that Raw Power came out. Yeah, the most magnificent albums ever made. In the summer of 69, Chrissy enrolled at Kent State University to study art. But Nixon is uh, definitely looking at students as the enemies in the country right now. We're, we are going to have to go underground. Uh, I think it looks pretty bad for us. In May of 1970, Chrissy took part in the Kent State protests against the U.S. invasion of Cambodia. The Ohio National Guard fired into the crowd, killing four students. A good friend of mine, people I know were involved, I was involved. Some students threw a few rocks at them, said piss off off the campus, and they just shot into a very crowded commons. I was carried off the campus. The campus was evacuated. Chrissy never returned. The 60s were over, but Chrissy Hind was not going to be stuck in Ohio. It's just the clock on the wall said it was time to go. It was as simple as that. I knew for a long time I was going to leave there. I really didn't want to see America. She set out for the place that inspired her teenage dreams. With $500 in her pocket, Chrissy took off to London. I was young. I was free. I had a passport. Yeah. <laughs> Turn me loose. In England, she began writing rock reviews for the New Musical Express. She interviewed artists from David Cassidy to Brian Eno. Chrissy was finally working in the industry she loved, but she quickly grew disillusioned with the job. I was this kid from Northeastern Ohio, so I had a whole different manner about me, I guess, and I didn't know how to write. I thought that you had to be qualified. I mean, you know, I guess none of them know how to write. And I kind of then started thinking, well, if it's that bad, why don't, you know, maybe I can do something better. In 
1974, Chrissy took a job at a clothing shop owned by future Sex Pistols manager Malcolm McLaren. Filled with ripped t-shirts, rubber skirts, and S&M gear, sex became the hub of the London punk scene. Chrissy became friendly with the kids who hung around the shop including the future Sex Pistols. When Chrissy's visa ran out, she asked Johnny Rotten to marry her so she could stay in England. Johnny chickened out and sent Sid Vicious in his place. He had his uh, birth certificate with him because he was, he was really young. And um, we sort of had him by the scruff of the neck down there at the registry office. And it was closed for some extended holiday for some reason. So we could have gone in the next day, but he... Um, he had put someone's eye out with a glass or something, and so he had to go to court himself or something, so I guess it just wasn't meant to be. Chrissy solved her visa problems on her own, but she still didn't have the one thing she really wanted, a band. She watched as her friends became famous as the Sex Pistol. She tried to start a group with her pal Mick Jones, but pretty soon he moved on to The Clash. It seemed like everyone she knew was setting the rock world on fire, and Chrissy was left behind. I was like crying. I was, I've never been so frustrated. I used to get on the, the underground, you know, the tube in, in, in London, and I would just sit there. I'd just go from one end of the line to the other and just sit there. I was too depressed even to get off the train because I had nowhere to go anyway. It seemed like I was there for all, right around the time when they all got their final lineups together. And I thought, oops, hang on, these guys really make sense together, and I'm the odd one out here. Oh, boy, you've been so We were all happening in groups. Yeah, maybe I was copying a little bit of attitude that this girl at the fringe of the scene was basically seen as a kind of no hope or camp follower, you know, a nice girl, but it doesn't come with a sign in a way. You know, it doesn't say, this is going to be great. You know, my attitude was all wrong when I was listening to her. But after that, she became, you know, greatest rock and roll female voice. Even though she worked her way into the innermost circles of British punk, Chrissy feared that there would never be a place for an American girl. I thought, I thought I was nurturing these people. I was like everyone's big sister, you know, but I knew I didn't fit. I didn't fit until I met these other guys that didn't fit. In 1978, she met Pete Thornton. He signed on as her bass player in the four long we were dating. I said, baby. I met guitar player James Honeyman Scott. Pete and Jimmy were both from Hereford, out in the sticks. They introduced Chrissy to a friend from home, Martin Chambers. As soon as Martin started playing, I, I can remember I had to uh, I had to turn my back on the band and face the wall because I was laughing so hard. And I realized that was it. This was th these were they were here. I was surrounded with the pretenders. Hello. I've been asked to say a few words about the pretender. Let's talk with Ape Farber. I'm really looking forward to coming to America. I'm really interested in the American political setup. I think I made a mistake with Nixon. They shouldn't have just impeached him. They should have just let Teddy Kennedy give him a little time. Next up is James Honeyman Scott. Hello. I've allowed you the privilege of entering my living room here in England, which you see I've turned into a bar. Now this one was a present to Pete Townsend from Joe Walsh. And Pete, a friend of his, has passed it on to me. Let's meet Martin Chambers, the drummer. He really loves nature. The ethereal minstrel of the sky. Why dost thou leave the earth where cares abound? That's a poem by Wordsworth about the skyline. Amazing. Last but not least is Chrissy Hyde. It's fascinating that uh, Japanese from where the hell is Akron? Why is one of the guys there? Ladies and gentlemen, the pretenders. It is time. The 
Pretenders played their first gig in December 1978, and only a month later hit the airwaves with the cover of Ray Davies' Stop Your Sobbing. Scott that brought this